Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to start up now. Uh, my name is Ed Engel, and I'm the Mobility Justice Advocate at the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition, SnowTrack for short. I will be facilitating uh, this panel. Uh, SnowTrack is a mobility management coalition that advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond uh, with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. To this, we convene public, nonprofit, and private transportation human service agencies that identify mobility gaps and opportunities, especially for our priority populations of people with disabilities, older adults, youth, low-income households, people of color, tribes, people born in foreign countries, or otherwise speak English as a second language, and veterans. Uh, we also want to take the time to Thank Executive Dave Summers for issuing a proclamation recognizing September 19th to the 25th as the week without driving in Snohomish County. Our six panelists today are Rick Elgenfritz, the CEO of Community Transit, Tom Hingson, Everett Transit Director, Senator June Robinson of the 38th Legis Legislative District, Snohomish County Council Member Megan Dunn, Everett Council Member Paula Ryan, and Everett Council Member Liz Fogelli. Uh, before we start up, uh, can I get a uh, can I get a show of hands from the audience of people who participated in the week without driving? This is gonna be. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who did participate in the week without driving. Uh, there's a lot of hands, so I can't get to everyone. Uh, but before we dive into our Q and A, uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna turn things to Anna to do a presentation regarding the week without driving. Awesome! Thanks so much, and thank you, Snowtrack, for organizing this. It's really awesome to have all your support in uh, getting the word without out there without week without driving, and then coordinating this uh, evaluation feedback session. I think it's it's wonderful to have your uh, your your work here. So I'm going to just share a quick presentation. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, hang on one second. There we go. All right, can you guys see my screen? I should say week without driving. Yes, yeah. Yep. Wonderful, all right, uh, wonderful. So yes, the week without driving uh, was a campaign, a challenge that we launched two years ago. So this was our second annual week without driving. Um, and it uh, was created as sort of a, a, a brainchild of the Disability Mobility Initiative, which is a program of Disability Rights Washington. And the Disability Mobility Initiative organizes non-drivers from throughout Washington state. And so the, the really the intention behind the Week Without Driving was to connect people who do have the privilege of driving uh, to the experiences of non-drivers. And uh, just based on, on, on national data, we know that non-drivers are around uh, a quarter to a third of the population. That includes people like myself who are disabled and can't drive because of our disabilities, but also folks who uh, can't drive or don't have reliable access to a vehicle for a whole host of other reasons. Um, perhaps they're too young to drive, they've aged out of driving, um, they uh, may uh, not have an ID, identification, or a driver's license for a bunch of different reasons. They can't afford a car. And so uh, we, we organized on drivers and sort of this broad intersectional, intersectional coalition um, to focus on our uh, mobility needs and what we could change to make it easier to get around without being reliant on a vehicle. Um, and so uh, the, the sort of the, the visible part of our organizing is the story map project. And that's what we began when we, when we first started organizing two, two and a half years ago, was interviewing non-drivers from throughout the state of Washington. And those interviews and profiles are viewable on our website. We've done over 230 interviews so far. And uh, we really wanted to highlight the expertise of people who figure out ways to get around their communities, even though those communities are often de designed only to be easily accessible in a vehicle. Um, so the week without driving, uh, 
uh, is, is a way of allowing people, who, as I mentioned, who have the experience of driving to understand, get a taste of what it's like uh, to navigate their communities, their, their daily and weekly sort of uh, responsibilities and tasks without the, the privilege of driving. And so um, the, the guidance was that you can get around whoever you want, but you just can't drive yourself in a vehicle. And so that means you can ask other people for rides, uh, you can walk, you can roll, you can bike, you can take the bus. Uh, you can even pay for a ride hail if that's uh, what you need to do. Um, and then, you know, I think the other part of this too is understanding that when people, um, there are times when it's just not going to work and and the responsibilities that you have are going to require that you do drive and under and, and thinking about that choice and that privilege that um, making that choice uh, allows you to have and what someone who doesn't have that choice uh, would do in your situation. Uh, we wanted to be real clear that this isn't a disability simulation um, and this also isn't sort of a, a we, we understand that that people who have um, more privilege and, and live in more walkable rural areas with better transit service, this is gonna be way easier, right? <laughs> um, so it's not some sort of test of, of uh, what kind of urban environment uh, you live in, um, but recognizing that, uh, that these challenges exist and that there are things that we can do in all of our communities, whether it's rural, uh, urban, suburban, to make it easier uh, for people to participate fully who don't have the privilege of driving. And so uh, just some quick stats from this year. Um, I think Ed shared the Snohomish County uh, resolution. We also had one from Governor Inslee uh, announcing it as the, making it as a proclamation, uh, calling for the official week without driving. Uh, and then this year we had over 450 participants, more than 80 public officials, including elected leaders. And then we also reached out to a lot of transit agencies to sign on to a letter of support as well. And so you're going to hear a bit from um, uh, transit agencies up in Snohomish County as well, but this is some of the other 15 transit agencies that signed on and really helped promote the event this year, which was awesome. And um, yeah, I would also encourage you to check out the Week Without Driving hashtag on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. I'm not sure there's a lot on TikTok yet, maybe a few posts, uh, to, to read about some of the experiences of people who joined us and shared that. We're in the process of compiling feedback from other folks who participated. And so uh, we will be doing a webinar with America Walks later this week. There's this wonderful webinar today. Uh, and then you can always send us your feedback and we'll be creating a report um, in the next couple of months that will sort of pull together all of the lessons learned this year and last year uh, from the events. So that's my contact information. And thanks again, I'm gonna turn this back over to Ed and Snowchak to uh, facilitate the conversation. Great, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, for our next portion, we are gonna move into the Q&A, but before we do that, I just wanted to recognize a couple people on the call. Uh, Representative Shelley Kloba. Uh, also, we wanted to extend an invitation as a panelist if you wanted to join, uh, to kind of participate, Shelley Kloba, Representative Shelley Kloba, you're welcome to join. Uh, and then we also wanted to recognize uh, Don Vaney, and council member Jan Schwedy, uh, who are also on this call right now. I muted myself. Uh, I wanted to turn to our Q&A. Uh, we encourage all panelists to keep their micro microphones off and don't wait to have your hand raised. You're welcome to just kind of jump in on each question that we give. Uh, and then the last 10 minutes will be open the questions from the audience. So for our first question, uh, our first question is, what are your usual travel modes? If the modes you use during the week without driving differ from your usual ones, what were they? And anyone is welcome to hop in that question. I'll just start and admit, I usually drive to work alone. <laughs> that sounds so sad. <laughs> I but... know. Also, but it's the truth. <laughs> me as well. Um, I do usually drive, uh, even though the past couple of years I've been trying to use the bus more often. Uh, the week without driving really helped me to get on the bus more often. So, 
same. I usually drive myself. It's about a four mile um, from one point in Everett to another point in Everett, and I have a, a covered parking spot. Uh, <clears throat> I'll add to the chorus. Uh, I probably drive alone about, I don't know, three to four days a week, and I have uh, parking at, at the office. I do bike and use transit uh, once or twice a week. So I took it as an opportunity to expand that um, and explore our network a little more. But uh, driving is sort of the thing. Well, to be fair, Rick, you live in, you don't live anywhere close to work, <laughs> right? Yeah, my drive is uh, 22 miles yeah. door to door. Um, so, but I can talk more about my non-driving experience later in the program. Well, I have the opportunity to work from home for most of the year, except when we're in session. And um, uh, yeah, so my commute is, you know, from my living room to my office or kitchen, sort of a three-way. Um, but the, um, and we'll get into this later, but the timing of that week was when we were moving from uh, a little uh, apartment in a, that we're living in temporarily in downtown Bothell, which was incredibly transit rich um, and moving our last things out of that apartment into our new home in an area that is, you know, more typical suburbia and not very transit rich. So it was an interesting um, time to try and um, not use our car. And that's the other thing, my husband and I um, share one car um, in the in currently because we both work from home. So got rid of it back in 2020, the, the second one. Hi, my name is Paula. Uh, so I have a couple different hats that I wear. One for my full-time job, I work at uh, the county campus building. And then for my part-time job, I am a city council member. And I'm one of those lucky folks that uh, live near downtown. So I have a walkability score for my house of 92. So generally I walk to either or both jobs, but if uh, there's a city council meeting that's going late, I'll usually drive knowing that it'll be dark by the time it's, uh, it'll be time to walk home. So even though it's only like, six or so blocks, I would prefer to drive just for safety purposes. So uh, for work related things, I would I usually walk, uh, but drive if I need to. And then for errands and whatnot, I'll drive. And I uh, drive most of the time, mostly out of convenience, I would say. And uh, it just takes longer. That's what I always learn uh, when I've done this week without driving twice and the big, one of the big takeaways is uh, the amount of time that it takes to get from point A to point B when you're not driving. What were the biggest barriers to getting where you needed to go? Uh, what gaps did you observe or navigate? If you didn't experience any barriers, why do you think that was the case? Well, public transit only takes you so far. Um, I work part-time for Snow Isle Libraries and their service center is down a long road parallel to I-5 that, um, so, you know, I, I could take public transit for part of the trip, but then ended up walking about a mile um, after that on not particularly friendly pedestrian, not particularly friendly for pedestrian um, streets to get to get there. So um, those are the gaps, right? Is you can take public transit part of the way, but it often doesn't get you to your final destination. I found, and again, I'm Liz Vogley, uh, that if you, I was having fun late at night trying to get home, but um, other people were working so that I could have that fun. <laughs> and when I went to catch the bus, I thought, oh, okay, the last one's at 10, it's nine o'clock. That was a Sunday. And I took the Swift most of the time. Um, I found out that they 
don't go after 8 p.m. on Sunday, 9 p.m. on Saturday, and I think it's 10, maybe it's 11, I can't remember, on the weekdays. And uh, so I had to go back to the event that I was at, which was homecoming, by the way. So we're also doing homelessness stuff, right? And had to ask for a ride from somebody that was there. So there was a lot of waiting. Yep. That was one barrier. Yeah, I'd add to uh, what both uh, Senator Robinson and Councilmember Vogley said that, you know, bus service can only take you so far and it also only comes so often. So there were a couple of times where um, I needed to get home from a, a community event or from a neighborhood association meeting. And so I had to keep my eye on the clock because if I missed that last bus, then I'd be, you know, in a pretty, pretty deep pickle. So I uh, just making sure that you, there's like part of you is in the event and making sure that you're focused on what you're doing, but then there's this other part of your brain that can't, that has to keep an eye on the clock just to make sure that you're uh, timing it right with the, with the last bus of the night or just the one that you need to your next destination. I'll add that it wasn't so much a barrier, I guess more of an inconvenience that once I got to the bus stop waiting for the first of two buses to take, there wasn't a place for me to really wait. There wasn't a shelter, there wasn't even a bench or you know a semi-seat. And um, so I, I just timed everything as closely as I could and walked briskly towards the intersection. And of course, if the bus passed before me, then I would know that, well, I'd missed that one and now I'm in trouble for 30 minutes. So fortunately I did not miss the bus, but it's just that feeling of, did I plan this right? Is the bus gonna be on time? Late's okay, early is not okay. So <clears throat> I'll share a couple thoughts. I echo Senator Robinson's observation about time. You know, if I if I drive to work, it takes 30 minutes. Um, and if I take transit and bike, uh, it takes an hour and 15 minutes. And if I just take transit, um, it's about, well, it's over two hours. Um, <clears throat> so I'm also very aware of my privilege as a cyclist. You know, I, I can get on my bike at my house in North Seattle and I ride up to Aurora Village and I get on the Swift line and you know, then I get off at airport road and ride the rest of the way to the office or casino. Um, and, you know, I'm privileged to even be able to do that, right? <clears throat> um, but some of the things I noticed, um, I, I tried to use different routes over the course of the week and shake it up a little bit. <clears throat> One day I rode over to Northgate and took an express bus to Linwood for a meeting. And then I took a 201 up to Mariner uh, to get on the green line over to, to the campus. And I noticed that the transfer environment <clears throat> between the 202 and the green line is really not very hospitable uh, in general, uh, especially to somebody who's uh, in a wheelchair. Um, it was hard enough to figure it out with a bike. <clears throat> you know, I basically had to get out in the arterial and figure out how to get across 128th um, <clears throat> so that caused some anxiety. And as I was thinking about how would somebody do this <clears throat> if they weren't an experienced, privileged cyclist like I am, um, <clears throat> that's a pretty specific example. Um, a bigger example, just in general, is Linwood Transit Center sort of struck me <clears throat> with this mindset for the first time. It's a really big place. And uh, the number of buses that go through there and the size of the bus loop and the relationship between the bus loop and the light rail station that's about to open, there's a lot of distance you need to cover uh, to wayfind around that facility. And uh, it struck me as another place where people are gonna have to spend time or people do have to spend time figuring out how to navigate uh, those transitions. So just a couple of observations to share. I thought <clears throat> it was very interesting. Uh, so in order to get, I took my kids to school and picked them up from school or just one of the times my husband would, would take them, but um, every day and that's in Bothell. So we had to take the blue line 
and transfer to the green line. And that's at um, Home Depot, let's say. And on the Monday that we went, uh, there was benches for everybody to sit on. Uh, then I realized on Wednesday that there were no benches anymore. And uh, so people are still gonna sit down, but not on the benches. And then of course the, you know, it's like, ah, I just missed that one. So now we're gonna have to wait, 15, you know, 15 minutes isn't terrible, but it's not quick. And especially with two kids, I have other surprises that were wonderful that I'll tell about later, but that was like, oh, no benches. And then this week, I was just so glad that it was sunny and warm uh, not raining, you know, that was really convenient for this week without driving. It's not always like that. Yeah, that was the biggest thing I noticed as well. So it was nice, mild weather and no rain um, <clears throat> in my, I had to walk. So walking to the bus stop, there's no sidewalks in my neighborhood and then no sidewalk along the main road uh, and then no bu bus shelter or seats or anything like that. But the other big barrier for me was also um, trip trip planning. So I really like, I think it sends you to like King County Metro for that trip planning, but I just Googled it and then figured out, you know, the best bus for me was about 10 minutes before when I usually leave. So it got me to work on time um, a little bit early and then knew when I need to leave. So the, the trip planning for when you uh, need to arrive was helpful. Um, tougher in the evenings. I have a dance class for my daughter and, um, it's from eight to nine. And so there were no evening buses to bring her home. Um, but then her class ended up getting canceled. So that was, <laughs> I would have probably needed to cheat because I wouldn't take her on a bike at that time. And um, it just was an inconvenient um, option and uh, not an option. Um, but then, then the other big barrier was cash, always having cash. I was spending a lot of my change and counting out change. Uh, and then I got an ORCA card, which is provided to um, county um, county staff, but um, uh, hard, hard, I just, we were kind of in a cashless world. So, um, so sidewalks, trip planning, cash, leaving early, um, those are the main barriers. I wanted to add a couple more too. There were a few times where I biked to my destination and I, um, I live north of 41st. So there's lots of, you know, gridded streets, sidewalks, and generally um, bikeable areas, but the bike lanes are mostly north-south and trying to head east-west in the city is really difficult to get across Rucker, to get across uh, Broadway, to get up either over or under I-5 to get to the other side. So uh, going east-west is pretty challenging. And then when you do get to those big intersections like Pacific and Broadway, you know, it's pretty unsafe for a person on a bicycle, which is then unsafe for people who are walking or some or for people who are uh, have have mobility challenges. So that was a big eye opener for me was just uh, the feeling of safety trying to head east west in the city on my bike. Many of you touched on privilege and mobility access. Uh, how has the week without driving made you think about your own mobility access slash privilege? Even without driving yourself, have you had access that others lack because of your proximity to the transit, sidewalks, services, because of your ability to bike, because of your race, income, or gender? The uh, last tweet that I had uh, for week without driving uh, on week on day seven said um, the ability to easily participate in a car centric mobility and transportation system is a function of privilege and participating in the week was a definite uh, reminder about how as a able bodied uh, white person with access to a car and access to money to put gas in my car. I spent $91 to fill my tank today. Um, that just makes it uh, easier for me to get around town, to access meetings, see people, have a social life, um, take my kids where they need to go and just participate in a built environment that's built for people who have access to cars and who could easily drive a vehicle as well. So it was definitely a, a reinforcement for the privilege that I do experience. Well, I certainly had, you know, some time to reflect on 
one of the maybe more positive ways that COVID has changed our lives. And um, there were, you know, most of my meetings are online and I scheduled one in person just to kind of see what that was going to be like. And sorry, phone ringing. Um, and it made me realize that the, the way that um, many of us schedule our days with, you know, one thing back to back to back to back with the other things. Um, I, I would have to, um, in order to have the volume of meetings that I do, would really have to rethink it and do it in a different way if I couldn't do them online, which also I know is a privilege because I have broadband, I have the equipment, I have the knowledge to do all of that. And that's not even a given. Um, if I were to have to go to places to meet all kinds of constituents, I would have to come up with a system where I just have one place and have people meet me there um, and just stay there and rotate through meetings um, because it, it, it took a while. Now, I was happy to have the chance and the sort of the motivation to do something I've been wanting to do for a while. And that is to use the, um, Metro, um, there, I guess it's a bit of a pilot project, their community, uh, yeah, what's it called? Community ride, where they come pick you up in the small bus. And I don't use Uber and Lyft myself, but as near as I can understand, it's an app you load onto your phone and it works very much like Uber or Lyft. You tell it where you are starting from and where you wanna finish and, um, it'll tell you if there's somebody available and maybe it's five minutes wait, maybe it's a half an hour wait so they can come pick you up. And when you get on, you just scan your ORCA card and away you go. It was very convenient, but that uncertainty principle of, you know, if I have to meet somebody uh, 15 minutes away at one o'clock, I may need to start at noon trying to figure out um, you know, a ride to get there using the community ride um, app. But it also gave me an opportunity to talk to the driver and get some, you know, just uh, indication of their experience and sort of who, who are some of the people in my neighborhood who are utilizing this app and this service. And um, I was pleased to know there was somebody who, uh, he's, he's an older gentleman, doesn't drive, but he was using the thing, uh, the ride on a daily basis to get down into the downtown and you know connect with people. So that you know gave him some um, opportunity to socialize and get out of his house, which is very important, as we all know. And then the other was a woman who uh, would get on with her two elementary school children, um, drive through the neighborhood on the thing. They would drop the two kids at the elementary school, and then she would continue on to the transit center where she would catch her bus to work. And I thought that was a, a pretty smart uh, way to go. Um, but anyway, so it, it gave me an opportunity to try out that service. And then I since then have been kind of evangelizing about it to everybody who lives in my area. My campaign manager uh, does not have a car. And um, when I told her about it, it just so happens that she lives maybe two blocks outside of the, uh, the zone uh, boundaries. And so she can easily walk, but now she has some customized transportation to come and have meetings at my house and, and do other things. So anyway, a little long, but it was a, it was a very uh, eye-opening experience. If I may, <clears throat> thank you for sharing that. And I'm just gonna indulge the group to do a little bit of a commercial because on Wednesday of this week, Community Transit is gonna launch our pilot project of that very service in Linwood. So, so we're gonna be uh, trying this out. Um, and it's just as you described, it's, it's um, a fleet of sedans and minivans that you can access with an app to access uh, discrete locations within Linwood. And um, we're planning additional pilots of this in Arlington and Lake Stevens as well uh, next year. So anyway, it's um, something we're all interested in, in learning about and trying to figure out if there's a better solution to make access to transit more convenient um, and, and easier to choose for people as, as we go into the future. 
Uh, as far as the privilege question, uh, I mean, I'm a walking billboard for privilege, so I try to be aware of it every day. And, and even thinking about the week without driving, I was feeling privileged because for me, it was just, oh, excitement about the fact that I get to bike every day. Um, and, uh, you know, even my biking experience is, is, you know, reflects some advantage. I'm in, in a very hilly neighborhood and I was able to purchase an e-bike and I can use the e-bike to get out of the neighborhood and get up to Aurora Village. So one of my concessions during the week was to park the e-bike and use my road bike and force myself to slog up the hills. And anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's very uh, real uh, when you're doing something like this and being asked to put yourself in a different headspace uh, to think about how others experience the, the built environment. Yeah, I kept thinking about how privileged I am that, well, first of all, of probably a half a mile from, you know, a lot of, well, a lot for Everett Transit. <laughs> Um, and then I'm able to walk, uh, you know, I can easily walk to get there, which not everybody can. Um, and you don't have your car to lug stuff around in. I, you know, I'm able to carry a backpack, um, which again, not everybody is just physically able to do. So just those things that you um, take for granted, I think, but yet, you know, you have to think about when you're not in your car. So. Yeah, I definitely recognize the privilege of being able to do some meetings um, from home or, or have my schedule a little bit more flexible. Um, last year, I'd been recovering from some minor surgery, and so I couldn't walk that far. And I realized how much I just canceled. And the same this year. Um, well, I'm I'm I cheat. I definitely cheated. So uh, <laughs> there was one meeting that um, I was meeting in Mill Creek, and then I had to get to the port for another meeting and there was only 30 minutes in between and there was just no way to take public transport to get there. Um, I mean, there's no even direct route. So um, really the privilege of being able to control your schedule in that way as well, um, where if I, if I didn't have a car to drive me or if I didn't have the ability to shift my meetings and change my schedule, then I would not have been able to attend those meetings. So the, the, um, isolation or just, um, you know, missing out is was really evident that um, if I didn't have that ability, then I would have missed out on a number of activities just uh, because there's no option, there's no transportation, or you're just up against a clock for timing. Um, and then safety was an issue a few times in the evenings and um, not feeling safe enough to uh, walk to a destination. Um, and so making, making decisions around that um, was definitely part of, part of my planning for the week. Uh, Representative Klobo touched on this, but did any, the anyone get to interact with people from your community that you don't normally interact with? And through those interactions, did you get any perspectives uh, regarding mobility access and privilege? I'll weigh in on this one. This is Tom. When I rode the bus, nearly everyone was masked. Nearly everyone was into their own space. So I would say no, there, there, nobody spoke to anyone. And even waiting at the bus, if there's one or two people, you might say, has the bus arrived yet? And then you look up at the Swift. Well, of course not, because it says it'll be here in six minutes. So I, I did find it different than other times when I've ridden the bus and, well, pre-COVID times reading, riding the bus. There's just, right now the people are more, you know, protective of themselves and maybe a little more closed. So that opportunity would take longer. You'd have to be on it a lot in order to develop some kind of relationship, I think. I met so many people, which is completely opposite. Um, 
Tom here, but I'm also a very talkative and love to meet people type of person. So would I have met them any other day? Probably. Um, but in my experience, not a whole bunch of masking was going on. And when um, I asked like the first day that I was going from the blue line to the green line and having to cross all of the streets. Um, I asked one gal with a backpack, you know, am I supposed to pay again? What? I mean, I have a card. I had an ORCA card that the city pays for. It's very easy, but it's like, how many times do I put it up to the thing? And um, I also looked probably, you know, like one of them. Uh, cause I typically go barefoot and I've got my own backpack and, um, whatnot. So she's like, well, she'd actually didn't know. Maybe she gave me some answers, but she's like, just get on the back of the bus because that's typically easier to get through, you know, like not paying or not doing that transfer payment. Um, cause it's really expensive and, um, also trying to cross the street and the signal didn't work across 100 no across 99 from west to east and the signal thing didn't work the button wasn't working that got fixed by the way thank you to whoever's listening that did that um but a person on the side with me and my kids they they just ran for it the first time and I was like kids if it doesn't go this next time then we'll also run for it but this is where most people get hit by cars so let's wait um and the dude that we that saw us heard us went running anyways he pushed the button on the other side for us so we didn't have to make a run for it we just had to do the regular risking our lives crossing that street um I met a lot of other people and it was super fun and um I asked somebody to not smoke pot on the bus and they're of course not we wouldn't do that I'd never do that, but they were you know passing the pipe, but not with the smoking just like whatever it was, it was a lot of fun. It was fun. I'm not surprised you met a lot of people Liz. <laughs> uh, I met some people on the last day, uh, the first day was kind of like reserved and quiet, um, but on the last day I overheard a conversation between the bus driver and a woman in the front and um uh, they were talking about politicians and st3 and the decisions that are made around buses and whether or not they're going to merge community transit and everett transit um so i just kind of politely made my way to the front and i said you know you should know that i'm a politician and if there, there's something you don't want to hear you don't want me to hear then um full disclosure like uh i'm your second favorite politician um so uh we had a really great open candid discussion about whether or not everett transit should um, merge and um as we were talking the bus driver um she was like isn't this your stop so she remembered me from just taking the bus like twice that week um remembered my stop where i'd gotten off and i was like no i'll ride it two more because you know i can get my steps in um, but i was so impressed that uh you know, one new person on the bus that week, and she remembered exactly what my stop was and where I'd gotten on and where I'd gotten off both times. So, um, had had really good discussions with um, uh, with that group, and and it was really eye opening to hear their concerns around that potential merger um, and just how looped in they were with community events. So, um, I don't want to give it away, but they didn't like the idea of marching <laughs> and uh, losing ever transit and that kind of local local service. So um, interesting. Yeah, I had some really good discussions and same for waiting with the bus, you know, always questions around, you know, when's it coming and um, uh, where'd you come from, things like that. So met some new people, it was a good opportunity. And I know for, I know I have a friend who registers people to vote all the time waiting for buses. So that's a good, good area for uh, trapping people in conversation. So I I do want to <clears throat> echo a little bit what Councilmember Dunn was saying, and this is a little bit broader than the week because I was pretty much a failure during the week um, in, in actually getting to places on the bus. However, like I said, I had lived in Bothell 
right in the center of Bonthal, very transit rich, wonderful. And I, um, I, I we got spoiled by that opportunity. Um, but then and then in time since that I've ridden the bus um, to a person, the drivers are so knowledgeable, very helpful. And like, I've had them bend over backwards to be like, you know, and particularly in Bothell, there's sometimes some uh, temporary construction. And at, at that time there was, and so routes were being diverted to places and they were just very accommodating knowing that this was a disruption in the regular pathway and they just really wanted to try to get you where you wanted to go. Um, so yeah, just across the board, really high quality staff who cared very much. In fact, one, there was a, a older gentleman, I would guess uh, had had a stroke at some point in time, moved very slowly and he was warmly greeted and there was no impatience on the part of the bus driver. They waited as long as it took to have that uh, man uh, find his seat and get settled and, you know, so that he wasn't off balance, but he fully was seated and stable before the bus moved on. And it just showed such a, a sensitivity and a caring. I was very impressed. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to give our last question before we open up the Q&A for the audience or for audience to ask questions. But our last question is, how will you incorporate the lessons and experiences that you gathered from the week into your work, your advocacy, or your support for mobility justice? Well, this is Council Member Vogley, and I'm going to tweet more about it. I'm going to talk more about it, and I'm going to get more stories, and I'm going to probably mention it at least once a month at Council during comments about, you know, I already do. So um, I will continue and hopefully just get gain more experiences to share. I think it, it got me even a little bit more so into the habit of whenever I'm looking um, on my Google Maps to get from you know point A to point B, utilizing both the car little icon to see and then utilize and just doing a comparison of what would it take if I were doing public transit for this and then kind of doing the calculus in my head about you know the, the pluses and minuses both in time and actual cost. Uh, you know, uh, how much I'm spending. Um, and then of course, factoring in parking and gas and time and uh, trying to come up with what's what's the easier way to go. Um, so I think just making that a habit so that I try to make the best choices that I can. Um, and in fact, I was on a business trip, came back from the airport and it would, would have been 4.30 for my husband to come pick me up. And I thought, I love him and I'm not gonna make him battle traffic at rush hour to SeaTac Airport. And it was very easy to just take the train and then switch to a bus. And he came and picked me up like a mile from our house. So um, I think the more I do these things, the more convenient it is. And the more I actually learn about the system itself and how it works for the people it's meant to serve. And I can get an observation of who's on the bus and who's not. And um, I think that that kind of uh, frontline observation can only be a positive in trying to inform um, any decisions that we make in terms of transit and you know, always have that lens of looking through, what if I didn't have a car? How does whatever this project is, how is that going to serve me? I plan to be even more vocal about just changes to the built environment to make sure that everybody can get around regardless of their ability level. So a better street lighting, better, uh, more sidewalks and sidewalks in underserved neighborhoods so that folks don't have to walk directly along a busy street, uh, better intersections to make sure that crosswalks and cross signals are working and that folks have enough time to cross the street, especially along uh, 99 and evergreen where there's 
a sidewalk desert like, or crosswalk desert, I guess. Um, and then better protected bike lanes as well. Just, you know, more than just sharrows on the street, but like actual protected bike lanes to make sure that folks that are on a bicycle are able to get where they need to go. Um, I would share a couple things. One, I think it's been said this is the second year uh, for this event. And um, I want to commend the Disability Rights Washington group for this, the creativity of this event, recruiting people to participate and then tweet about it and share their experiences. Is, it's an innovative and impactful way to go about it. Um, since it is the second year, we had a little bit more of a advance notice that it was coming. So our customer experience group actually used it as a team building and a training opportunity. So they assigned uh, each member of the team with a, a persona to basically go out and experience the, the system as someone in a wheelchair or someone visually impaired or someone deaf or uh, so on and so forth, and then come back and they sort of held a group debrief to share their experiences um and and document some learning about how that could help uh in training and, and awareness and performance within our customer experience group uh, they also we have a, a mock swift station uh, at our operating base over at uh, hardison road and they held an event where they invited <clears throat> other employees to come over and um essentially walk in the customer's shoes and use the, the mock station to stage some scenarios. And we had 15 employees show up and participate in that. And they got to see what it was like to board the bus from a wheelchair or uh, try to use the Orca system um, uh, without being able to see. Um, and likewise, you know, collected the observations from the employees uh, to disseminate out. So. It, it's uh, we we leveraged it a bit uh, to try to you know disseminate the the learning and the knowledge within the organization and, and found it something that really attracted a lot of interest. Uh, I agree with um, people who said they'd you know be louder, bigger advocates. So for the built environment, like Paula mentioned, and safe walks, um, sidewalks and safe walks to school and um, other areas. So to me, that's really critical that we're, we have that uh, built environment that's pedestrian friendly, friendly and bike friendly. Um, uh, and also flexibility, if there's ways that we can have more flexibility for our staff and for others um, for meeting times or leaving early or catching the bus. Um, or just changing, um, you know, our, our tires so we don't have to look. We can ride the uh, ride, ride our bikes and and not have to look so nice. Um, and I'm not advocating for spandex at at meetings, but uh, <laughs> maybe if we're all fine with wearing jeans to work. You know, as somebody who's been in the transit profession for nearly 40 years, you know, you get this feeling like, oh, I'm kind of an expert at this. But I think that what it reminded me is that the customer has a unique perspective and every customer's comment is really, really important. And yes, it may be you know, a repeat of what you've heard before, but there might be something new in there. And so as a, as a transit professional, I'm just committed to listening to the customer even more because, and, and, and using the system more. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been a big fan of transit and it reinforces how in order for transit to really work, it has to be reliable for people, um, accessible, of course, but also um, reliable. So as much as we can do from a policy perspective to expand transit, just like people were saying, you know, sometimes it stops at eight o'clock at night. And, and I understand all, I certainly understand all the decisions that are made around usage and when it's um, not cost effective to to run transit um, late, but um, you know, just as much as we can expand it is is going to make it better for everyone. So, so we have nine minutes. I just wanted to open it up for audience members that have questions for the panelists. Uh, you're welcome to shoot a question in the chat or just come off of mute and ask your question. Thank you. Thanks, Ed.
Uh, Joe Kunzler here. Um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and lob my question first because I'm busy working for Simple Flying uh, today. Um, it's no secret to some of you on this call, I'm a huge proponent of the Ever Transit Community Transit merger, I hope. Um, I uh, wonder what your thoughts are on trying to navigate free separate transit systems um, in Snohomish County, and you've got dead zones. Uh, where basically neither transit can really serve there because there's there's no real declaration of responsibility, such as the future of flight for starters. So I hope that's a good leading question. What do you think? Council member Vogley here. It looked like June was about to say something. Oh, do you want to go? Okay. No. Um, I have heard you very often and we have discussed stuff and I so appreciate your point of view. I think that we differ on this one. Uh, I'm not sure about the dead zones. I'm, uh, I think, um, I think that there are a lot of benefits that Everett Transit has to stay as Everett Transit. Um, and especially with the micro transit um, options that may be coming down the pike, um, just like in Linwood and somewhere else that community transit is doing. Um, I, speaking of dead zones, I don't know if this is one, but on fourth between Evergreen and 128th, like it goes unincorporated Snohomish and Everett. And it's like, I need it. I want to catch a bus from here to there. Give me a bus on that road, um, but it's not all Everett, and it's so I don't know how that works exactly. But um, I'll keep that short. But there you go. Uh, this is Brock here with No Track. Uh, I might just um, queue up Rick to maybe outline what the next steps are with the. Um, with that conversation are just so people know where to plug in. Putting me on the spot. Um, and I, I will uh, lean on my partner, Tom, uh, to uh, weigh in and, and correct me if I say anything out of uh, place. But um, I think most of the folks, at least the elected officials on this uh, Zoom call are aware that we're engaged in a joint planning effort to develop a conceptual consolidation plan that would bring Everett Transit and community transit together in one integrated network. <clears throat> and the, the goal there is to show how transit and service uh, could improve uh, within the city of Everett and, and countywide uh, with, a, with an integrated network. Um, so we have a, a joint uh, planning team that's doing that work uh, and a the joint policy steering committee with elected officials from each organization uh, providing guidance to that work. And, and so the, the goal is to uh, present a, a draft plan to the city council uh, sometime next year for its consideration. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, it is a decision by the city of Everett on uh, whether to pose this question to Everett voters, whether they want to join uh, forces with CT or not. So we're trying to be very um, transparent about that and, um, um, you know, work through the issues in a stepwise fashion and, and try to answer as many of those questions as we can uh, as the transit agencies uh, delivering the service so that policymakers can, can make some informed choices about how to best uh, provide for mobility uh, within the county. So more to come, but the the, the action is likely to pick up next year as we start to put draft plans together. Tom, uh, did I miss anything there? Tom had to step out right after 1250. Ah, so okay. unfortunately, you're the last uh, word on this. So all right. Yeah, I, I'll email Liz. I'll email yeah. Liz my follow up. OK. I have, a, I have a quick add on it, though. Uh, so uh, if I could speak for Tom, they, I, they uh, Everett Transit provided a presentation recently talking about how the move ahead Washington dollars are going to help to expand bus service in 
the city of Everett. So I'm hopeful that if there are some, some donut holes and some gaps in transportation services that these additional routes will help to fill that. So just wanted to add that quickly. I see a question in the chat and I really want to get to it before we have to leave and it's about drug use. May I? I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> And it says, my adult daughter uses transit daily. She experiences open drug use at the stops and on the bus, homeless hanging out at the stops, making it dangerous and uncomfortable when she is on transit. She commutes on her own and with her young daughter. And I can say, I absolutely uh, have, I share that experience, except for the everyday um, riding. But every day I did ride and every day I do ride, there is always drug use. And I'm, you know, even when I was driving the other day and, you know, at the bus stop that I normally would be at, I'm like, hey, kids, do you think that person's the dealer or the buyer? And, um, you know, it's not a fun game, but it was one that I played, you know, and we figured out, oh, he's the dealer. Um, and why is that person slumped down? So, I know that lots of people are afraid and I guess I choose not to be because um, for the most part, even though I, I wish it weren't true and I wish it were not happening and we need housing and we need resources, we need all of this. Typically the people either are like oblivious to what you're doing and so therefore not necessarily going to harm you or they're just really nice or or kind these I don't know I haven't met any meanies and there's a lot of people utilizing products that I don't <laughs> and it gives me a chance to talk to my children I don't find needles anywhere uh, people say that they do but I maybe seen a cap once um, and not just this week, I mean, you know, for years. Uh, so um, I wish it wasn't so, but it is, and I'm not sure what to do about it. I know that community transit took the, the seats out, <laughs> which, grr, but um, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Well, uh, council member, thanks for pulling that question forward because I didn't see the chat. Um, I'll just uh, add two comments. One, the uh, seats, the, the SWIFT stations are being redesigned. So uh, the windscreens are being modified and the seats will be reinstalled when the new windscreens are in. So you're seeing active transition happening. Awesome. Those, Did not those know. Facilities. Um, the safety and security question is a big one. And Brock, we could probably do a whole forum just on that. Um, community transit, we've made a decision to, uh, to uh, hire um, security officers, transit security officers in the budget I'm taking to my board of directors that's going to be pending before council member Schwetti here in a little bit, uh, funds um, a new unit of 18 transit security officers who will be deployed 24-7 across our system. Um, we contract with the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office to provide transit police support um, the sheriff's not in a position to be able to expand our transit police detail. So we've decided to step in and add an additional layer uh, to provide for safety and security starting next year with that unit. So I would agree with your characterization. You know, most of the folks out there are looking for shelter. Most of them are not looking for conflict. Uh, most of them need help of some kind or another. And so we're looking to provide some resources to be able to intervene and steer folks towards services, towards shelter, um, and protect the transit space uh, at our stations and, and on board our vehicles. So there, there's a lot of learning to be done here coming out of the pandemic. And um, as with microtransit, we're gonna be experimenting with these new approaches to, to providing a safe space. We are a minute over, so I just wanted to close things out with uh, a thank you to our panelists for participating and also our audience for uh, coming and watching. Thank you very much.